we're all just going to sit here silently. <laughs> Quiet. To wait for someone else to introduce us. <laughs> yeah, it says live. We're live, but I think Evan's got a bit of, bit right, of a delay there. All right, we're live now. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. All right, so we are ready for the panel at 6 o'clock. That is Unique Management Systems. We have a few authors here to talk about their very different magic systems they have in their books. We'll start off with Shami Stovall. Yeah, um, I'm Shami Stovall, Shami like the car cloth. <laughs> and I think I'm most well known for my Frith Chronicles magic system where people gain magical abilities depending on a mystical creature they bond to. Uh, I really enjoyed that magic system quite a bit, so I'm super proud of it. Cool. Yeah, Sorry. I don't know how much I should elaborate for my intro, so there we go. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. Ryan. Okay, who else you next? <laughs> I say we go across the stream. It looks like JR's next. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm JR Matt. JR. Uh, I wrote Jake's Magical Market and Portal de Nova Roma. So Jake's Magical Market is probably the more unique of the two. Um, it's card based with card evolution and um, other things like that. Um, yeah. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, go for me. What about you, cool. it's, it's easier. Yeah, um, I'm Jez, uh, obviously, unless you have real problems reading, in which case, you know, you probably shouldn't be in a lit RPG group. Um, I wrote a few books, which is why I ended up here, because I was too drunk to refuse. And I probably the most unique magic system I use isn't so much magic, it's more of nanotechnology based. Um, I arise my Arise Alpha and Arise uh, Dark Crusader series are based fully around nanotech and about elemental adjustments. So resonances more than anything else. Uh, books three and four will get a lot more into the resonance of things and being able to control magic through essentially a form of magnetism almost. So yeah, a bit fucked up and very, very complicated if you don't make the correct notes at the right time. Let's just say that. <laughs> Nice. Uh, I'm Jess, JD Astra is what I go by. Uh, I have a couple of different magic systems that I really enjoyed. And Jess, you mentioned nanotechnology. I use that in my far future post-apocalyptic cultivation series, Bastion Academy. Um, but I obfuscate it because they've forgotten what technology is. So it's really fun for the main character to kind of learn like, oh, there's little tiny robots inside me. <laughs> um, but the one that I most recently wrote that I really enjoy is Deathless Dungeoneers. Um, and that system is uh, based on anima, spirit, essentially, and these magical mandala tattoos that are granted to the, um, I guess, I was going to say players. They're not players. It's like a second world fantasy um, granted to the people through the dungeons. So the dungeons are kind of what are the holders of power uh, and granted to different players, players, people. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Xander Boyce. I wrote uh, the Red Mage system, and then also uh, <laughs> sorry, the uh, Farming Livia series. Um, and apparently, how many potatoes did you have to mutilate to come up with Star Maps? Um, you'd never mutilate a potato. You can only use a potato. Uh, potatoes then become a higher form of potato which can then be used for other things like, you know, French fries or things like that. Um, but yeah, so my, my most, uh, my most probably unique system is the Zathrite system in Red Mage, which is uh, sort of based around Path of Exiles, skill gem system combined with a Final Fantasy VII's Materia system, um, uh, all mixed up in a very convoluted, uh, <laughs> combo creating system that causes a lot of really fun paperwork when you have to like do 30 Zathrite all at once. <laughs> 30 new spells all at once. Yay. I actually thought it was a little more reminiscent of Final Fantasy X. So it's interesting. So Jess, I'm curious, which, which one did you play first? 10 or seven? I played seven first. Okay. So it's interesting to me who who says ten and who says seven. Ten was not an uh, definitely not a like a conscious influencer. 
whereas seven was a conscience influencer. So anyway, but yeah, a lot of people say 10 as well with this fear grid. It was just more recent, you know, mm -hmm. stuck in my mind more. <laughs> never beat uh, final fantasy eight <laughs> final fantasy oh gosh you never beat it or you you, you will never no no, no they will never beat it it was fucking good no really final fantasy eight was, was the worst <laughs> because the whole point of that game was to not level up for half of the game until you got like all the good spells and then you could level up better rename the panel right now which final thing <laughs> <is the panel? laughs> this, this topic <laughs> well for final, final fantasy does have a lot of really interesting magical systems though they all have a very unique oh. very um kind of different systems so you have the you know the materia system in seven you have the um esper system you have in, in six you know all those other there's there's lots of different really cool systems that final fantasy does and i think that's one of the best things about that that franchise is that they all have very different, um, you know, magical systems that are similar but different. But eight's draw system was the worst. It was painful. See, I I didn't play many of those games because um, I I loved eight. It was the first one, first Final Fantasy I played was eight, and then I tried. I, th I think it was it was eight, and then I tried nine, and it was like the main character was a child. Yes, I tried seven. Nine, I have a problem with nine. And it's yeah. like. The fuck? And it was just sort of each of them that I was. Wait, trying wait you had a problem with seven? I, what was I your? Think it was, I think it was seven. I tried after that and just couldn't get into it. Uh, there's a there's a pretty big technological gap between seven and eight and nine. Like there's a there's a fairly significant graphical delay between those two movies, uh, mm -hmm. or between those two games, I should say. <laughs> I, I call yeah. everything movies. I call books movies. It's all just a movie in my head, even though I don't really watch movies. Um, so, anyway. JR, so, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on Final Fantasy? <laughs> <laughs> just totally I, mean, I grew up playing 7. Um, yeah. Love 7. Didn't play 8. Um, but I think it comes down to what you played first. So, you know, if you love 8 because that's what you played first, I think there's just a nostalgia to it that there's, yeah. you know, so 7 was the first I played. So I love 7. I tried, I bought some version of it, not the, the remake, but the original a long time ago, years ago. And you just can't play it again because the graphics are so bad. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. when I was a kid, it was like, this is amazing. Everything yeah. looks so good. And I look at it now, I'm like, the main character is like, Three, you three know, polygons, three, yeah. three yeah. four yeah. triangles yeah. mashed together. Yeah, he's a triangle <laughs> that you run around a map. So. It's so realistic, guys. It's so square. <laughs> it, it was think, amazing as a kid. Well, it's, I, think I the remember storytelling is what shows through then, right? Like yeah. when the art sucks, the storytelling is what shines. Well, I Sorry. don't know. I was still, Maybe I was still should... in love with Tifa back then. So who knows? <laughs> a man of Did culture. You, uh, did you like Madonna's uh, outfit as well? Madonna? The <laughs> pointy. The pointy. Triangle boobs? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> There's more than two perfects yeah. on this panel. <laughs> Sorry. Like the polygon boobs. I mean, that wasn't. Whatever. T Tifa's character uh, was what I liked, but it's embarrassing how long. Of course, of course. Because you're a mature man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> as a as a 14 year old kid, I was definitely a mature man. <laughs> no, they were triangular, Gary. Uh, Kyle had a great question. What? Um, how did you guys each come up with your unique magic systems? Oh, so. Um, mine is uh, probably a little easiest. I, uh, I'm really obsessed with things like Pokemon, uh, Monster Rancher. I really loved uh, video games like The Legend of Dragoon. Like, oh, uh, that was brilliant. Azure Dreams? Yeah. Azure Dreams. I made oh, a yeah. reference to that in one of my books. Uh, nice. it's, so, it's so obscure. I feel like, you know, I'm really glad somebody else <laughs> has played that game before. Um, I really, really love Monster Companions, Familiars things of that nature. Um, and I really wanted like a unique magical system with bonding to them, um, which is how I did my most unique system. And then in my other system, I just wanted uh, really interesting ways to gather experience because I've always felt that gathering experience is um, almost comical or hilarious. Uh, sorry, my other 
book that I wrote, the LRPG, is the Nexus Games. And when people die, they drop crystals, and the crystals are experienced. And I always just love the idea of going around killing like rabbits and getting <laughs> experience points. So I made a unique system based off of killing. Anyway, so it reminds yeah. me of uh, oh the Scott Pilgrim, where they they drop into coins. They did yeah. yeah. integrate into coins. Yeah. Just like... <laughs> exactly. That always made me laugh. That just made me lol so much. So those are really my those are really my draw pools is that i feel like experience is so unique and also familiar bonding is it, it gets me excited I, any sort of bond with a monster creature i'm i'm there even if it's the cheapest made thing you've ever seen in your life <laughs> so there's four perverts just <laughs> <laughs> I was I was even quiet i was just like so oh. for me, the card system i mean i grew up playing magic since i was a kid and then that's and even the old Star Trek card game. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Mm -hmm. That that shit was good. Uh, my friends and I through college even played that. Um, and and then that evolved into playing like the online card games and things like that for the last 20, 10 years. Um, and there was just a day like where I realized, you know, there's not any card-based lit rpg because i've been reading lit rpg you know i've read like everything in the genre and i was like there really wasn't anything out there like that and it just kind of i was like whoa like that would be really cool and i started thinking of how i would do it and like you know wanting it to be you know more than just cards where i wanted to be able to evolve them and change them and level them and that they became a currency and it just kept expanding in my mind. I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And this was like a year before I even started writing anything. Um, and and then I was like, okay, I, you know, this is such a fun idea. And I've been bouncing around my head for so long. Like I should just sit down and write it. And, and, and then I did. And it changed as I wrote it. But yeah, I was really inspired by my love of playing card games and doing yeah. it all my life, you know. I really liked when I was when I was first reading Jake's Magical Market. I've because I've been wanting a card based um, lit RPG for a long time, and but I always kind of thought when I was doing ideas in my head was it's going to sound very Deus Ex Machina ish when you do it because it's it's all about you know the gotchas like the the part of playing a TCG that you enjoy is grabbing you know those new packs and spending all that money and getting the the rare card or whatever and like that and i was and i was trying to figure out a way to 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 include that magic of you know discovery of 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 you know spending huge amounts of money to wizards of the, giving <laughs> huge amounts of money to the wizards of the coast um and i really liked how you did it in in jake's magical market where the they would drop their own cards you could go and kind of kill uh, the monsters that you wanted the, the cards for yeah, I wanted to add that feeling of like, okay, if I go out and I kill 50 monsters, you know, like two of them might be rare, might drop a rare card or something like, and so, because that was that that fun of un yeah. unpacking those. The gasha. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You pull the <laughs> trigger. Yeah, but instead you put it into farming or like killing and, you know, and, yeah. I did also like the fact that they're currency as well. I thought that was that was very well done. Like the deck building component of trading with your friends and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what led me into part two being a lot darker, which some people don't really particularly like. But because when you have a system like that, the reality is, is that people who have a lot of money can buy 10,000 packs of cards and they can get the good ones eventually. And so yeah. You know, it starts fun when it's like, cool, it's a card based system. But then you realize, well, actually, this system wasn't really that that good. <laughs> Didn't really, it wasn't an equal playing field when you start to really look behind the scenes of Magic the Gathering's business model. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Wizards didn't make an even playing field? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, for me, it was very much a case of I. I like the the way that nanites change things, um, so I have to explain a little bit about Arise. So for Arise, it's a case of we are biological weapon variants. So we were forcibly evolved way back, way way back, um, going back to basically. Did anybody watch Giver? MacGyver. MacGyver. Yeah, like the old '70s Man. show where you like. 
made a bomb out of toothpicks and <laughs> no one no, no, MacGyver. No, no, Giver. Um Giver was based similarly. It was uh, a man I think you're ago. still saying MacGyver. I'm hearing what? MacGyver. I, maybe yeah. it's just a weird like everything everything in his accent just sounds like there's a Mick in front of it. <laughs> I think it's MacGyver is what he's trying to say. Giver. 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 Yeah. G U Y V E R. Oh, it's a okay. Yeah. But basically, that one was the, a similar precept that we were made, we were made by aliens. And that definitely not give up. Definitely not. Okay, give so this is why none of us have heard it. That. It's a European and South American film series, which is why none of the it, Americans have heard of it. Oh, no, no. no <laughs> it's been big for a little while. But anyway, yeah, Giver, I used some of the ideas from that in the biological weapon variants. But then I changed it into the reason that we are the way we are is we were made to be weapons by elves, essentially. But that we were tested and found to be very, very, very good at it. And the first prototypes went rogue. So then the people that had been sort of trying it, like any good corporation, had a small group who'd been testing it who were told, what the fuck have you done? Let, let's wipe this whole thing out, get rid of it, you know, just bury the whole, pro by the whole project, let's abandon it. They've moved on. And they've basically abandoned humanity. So humanity has then evolved further on. That's why there's no missing link using the, the old missing link type pro type plans. But the reason that when you roll forward, when the main character gets his nanites unlocked, he's the only one to have this. So it's literally a case of he can do things with the nanites that are possible, but that have been designed for a weapon. So it's, you know, this isn't a nice system. This is designed by aliens for us to be able to upgrade ourselves by claiming nanites from others, from either to be a gift from our overlords to say, hey, you, you did really well, pat on the head, here's a, an upgrade for you, or for us to be able to fight our fellow humans and harvest them. So as time's gone on, you know, thousands of years down the line, we've got this mass of nanites inside of us, most of which are totally useless and are just miscategorized as white blood cells or whatever because they look organic and they're part of us so people have just gone oh that must be what they do and then building the system from that and going well, what kind of tech would you have what kind of upgrade path would you have if you were first of all looking to design a weapon but all of you fucking Kalen I'm telling you he's a serial killer really yeah. against you, kid. you've got problems um, <laughs> <laughs> well no I like the sound of it too it sounds great <laughs> No, uh, it's harvesting humans. Man, the one that <laughs> that's, a bit like... that's what experience gathering is. That's what I'm talking about. That's what yeah, <laughs> that's yeah what the reality it's of these systems are not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing is rather than it being XP of hey, you've got 12 points. Well, who who assigns those points? How do you get those points from the gods? How does it change you? Well, nanites, you know, you stab somebody with a harvest blade, rip the nanites out of them. You physically got those nanites. That's how you upgrade. So. And it was an opportunity to go a bit darker with things, you know. I I uh, I, I had a, a pseudo system I was working on with um, Christian Gillard where we did something similar. It's uh, based around old Incan beliefs, and they would drink the blood of their foes. That was how they would get their their power. So anyway, <laughs> only mildly disturbing. Yes, only a little bit. Well, that is a big, big, fat question. Um, first, I'll just mention really quickly Deathless Dungeoneers. The magic system that I have in there is the magical mandala tattoos that are gifted by the dungeons. Um, that one was sort of inspired by um, sort of a combination of like D&D &D 5e monks who, who often like adorn themselves with really crazy tattoos. And I was like, well, what if these tattoos like could twist and like the center tattoo would be one type of spell and around the outside the ancillary like pieces of the mandala would be different types of spells and the more you rotate and twist the different types of combinations could be created um and then like build them out farther and farther and farther so that you can get really sort of specific sort of like the haplo magic from death gate cycle i haven't read that but oh maybe now I oh will. <laughs> Uh, so the, the patrons, I think they're called the patrons. It's the patrons and the sartans. So the patrons in Deathgate Cycle, they have tattoos on their body, and they touch various parts of their body to cast magical ah. spells. But eh, anyway. Typically no need. Like um, I don't think I have any requirements for touching. Lots of them are um, 
voice activated or thought activated, um, the power behind it is usually speech or communication, which I run into problems in book three uh, when I have a mute character, um, which I really enjoyed having having her join the squad. That was so much fun. Um, but yeah, as for the question, I'll try to answer it super quickly from Brian. That's the one balancing the stats and the systems being tied to the curriculum. Um, I mean, yeah, if they're going to school to become super powered magical badasses, the curriculum should include super power magical badass stuff. And they should be graded on it. So makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, magical academy yeah. stories are usually a little more slice of life, a little bit slower. Uh, and so the center of the book is pretty big and chunky. And usually the end of the book is like some sort of trial that the character has to go through past that year of school. That's pretty common. Um, I didn't go that route with mine, and I don't think that landed so well with a lot of people. So, <laughs> um, I was just trying to think because I'm trying to think of like classic uh, Magic Academy schools, and it's like Harry Potter, and that's mm -hmm. about the only one I've got. <laughs> There's like I a million know. of them. They're, I know they're like my favorite subgenre. Oh. I will read anything that has a Magic Academy in it. it, it I agree. Written by a four-year-old, and I. Yeah. Would read it. <laughs> I 100 percent agree. I'm trying to. Yeah. Academy Arcanist. I recently read. Oh yeah, I I did my own take on a wacky academy, and I only covered one week of school, so I understand Jess being like, "Oh, yeah. I didn't do the standard normal thing," and I'm like, "Yeah, you you yeah. keep doing it." It's so hard when you have to like, and then seven months passed while they were training very very hard, and nothing else happened except training. Well, and I think to, so. I think you have to do those time skips where you're doing like, mm -hmm. "Hey, you know," and then they you know, studied for midterms. And, yeah. uh, and then you get to like the fun part, which is the actual test for midterms, which is, you know, going and being a magical badass or whatever it is. Uh, right. uh, yeah, no, I, I think that my sister, <laughs> I think my sister is, is writes a book where she's got a magical academy and she's three weeks in after uh, four books. So, you know, <laughs> perfect <laughs> stuff would happen. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So uh, as for me, um, I think the original question that we were answering here was what in, incited us to, to write our unique magic systems. Um, so when I started writing Red Mage, it was one of the first, I mean, it was one, it was, it was 2016, 2015, um, which was back, you know, before a lot of other lit RPGs were made. And I wanted something that was apocalyptic i'd oh i've been playing a lot of path of exile at the time so i was like i really like this you know ability to combine uh, one of one of path of exile's greatest advantages and also one of the things that makes it really hard for new people to play it is that um you can't go in there without a build in mind and you kind of have to have these pre-designed builds um where where you have like six or seven skills that have like eight or nine amplifying skills around or, or two or three three to five amplifying skills on them. And you have to like make these huge combinations of, of things, but you can do anything in Path of Exile. You can have like stuff that kills people as you walk around. You can have stuff that like makes these turrets that turn into random other stuff. Anyway, so I liked that idea and I wanted to kind of implement that in a way that, uh, uh, you know, wasn't um, copyright violation. <laughs> uh, and so I kind of mixed that with, uh, with, with the Zathrites or with the with the Materia system, uh, I've always liked. Uh, Final Fantasy VII was one of those those transformative games for me as a as a young kid, where I uh, just you know the idea that magic coalesces into these crystals that you can then use to like power up and become you know crazy strong uh, was always just really cool in my head. But I agree. Yeah, sorry, fifteen days, Jay. Sorry. Not, not three <laughs> weeks. Not quite three weeks yet. This stream is now sponsored by Path of Exile. <laughs> <laughs> and Final Fantasy. And Path of Final Exile Fantasy. 2 coming out soon. Great, great game. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, what's this, what is something you came up with for your unique magic system that others have now copied or done something similar? Hmm. Hmm. I don't think I've ever seen anyone that's copied the Zathrite system in any form. 
No. Um, I don't think I've seen any other card. Mm -hmm. um, cards, have in, cards have become more popular. I wasn't technically the first one to publish oh. in the Western audience. Um, Didn't Kit no, Fablo I, do, do one? Mine was done, but I, it took forever to do the card art, and the, I wanted the right cover. And so another writer, Goblin Summoner, published before me and i remember when he published and it was like card based lit rpg i was like oh no. <laughs> but it's fine because you know it's part of a growing genre i do right. think it's yeah. becoming more popular there's a couple good ones on uh royal road right now all the skills i think is the name and um some other stuff that's coming out that's doing really cool stuff with the idea and i'm by no means the first to come up with it it's been popular in other countries and other genres and stuff. Right. I think, I mean, to that question too, like Jez and I both have series with that use nanites. And mm -hmm. from what I understand, our series, the, the way that we use them, not the same at all. So, I mean, like you can have different components and different pieces. Like you can have many different card, <laughs> card based styles and and they still won't be the same. I think mm -hmm. that's the great part uh, about lit RPG is there's so many different ways to manipulate uh, and use these systems to yeah. make something that feels fresh and new. Yeah, what actually my, my next coming up book is actually uses nanites in a very different way from what you guys use. So yeah, you just reminded me of the fact that I'm writing a book that is talking about that. <laughs> well, um, just to go on what Jess was saying, uh, I have a writer's group. And every January, we do like a writer's January where we pick a theme and we all write the first three chapters of this theme. So like last year, we did Dungeon Core, where we all had to write our own Dungeon Core book. Um, and even though we all had the exact same parameters, it needs to be a Dungeon Core, it needs to be fantasy, uh, you know, the main character becomes the core. Like we had very specific things. Everybody wrote something crazy different than the last they were not similar even in the slightest except for the fact that they were dungeon core so i 100 yeah. agree even if you have quote unquote a similar idea the execution is really where you know it's it's leagues different a uh, studio c did a really interesting uh copy of that where they took um basic plot outlines and they said you know star wars and harry potter are essentially the same plot when you yeah. boil it down to <laughs> yeah. you know very basic components um obviously they're not at all but very basic components they're like it's an old an orphan staying with his uncle and aunt who you know find a, a magical old wizard who teaches them mystical with mystical skills that have been forgotten and he has a scruffy friend and a and, a, and, a, and another female friend that hook up together and not him anyway it's um, too bad that the Dursleys didn't die via fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, Petunia has such a good redemption arc, though. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, those people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those things. My favorite thing about the, the Harry Potter series is why, um, who is your favorite villain and why is it Dolores Umbridge? <laughs> <laughs> um, because she's just such a great, terrible person. Yeah, I think it's because we've all met or worked with people yes. like her, yes. and it's just like you know, the people that you've worked with that you just want to go. They, you you fantasized about doing your job and about going in with a shovel and just going. Well, that they might just never know. They never know that they're her, you know, and uh, yeah. they just they think that they're the hero in their own life, and yeah. you're like, no, you're the villain in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you never milked a house elf? We do not talk about that, Kit. We do not talk about milking that house elf. That was a different day, and there was a lot of drugs involved. Caitlin has a pretty good question. If you were in yeah. a magic system governed world. Hmm. Um, I've always really enjoyed sorcerers in the D&D &D sense. Or warlocks. Both of those, I feel like, are interesting variations of wizard. Sorcerers, just because all of their magic seems a little more innate, and Warlock, because making a pact with some sort of higher power creature thing sounds cool. Maybe I'm just insane. I'm really into this category of, you know. <laughs> I got a direct but, line to my god, and he gives me power. Exactly. I've got friends in high places. <laughs> or low places. <laughs> yeah, so probably one of those two classes. Who doesn't want to use honest to god magic? I would want a class that lets me live forever and have like perfect health um, because I would want to see 
history. That's always been my love of thing. Like I've always wanted to be able to go back in history and see it or live to see the development of the cultures in the world. And so if there was a class that gave me like perfect regeneration and eternal life or whatever, even if I didn't have particularly powerful spells, but I could just survive everything, I would take that. And undead. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'd, I'd be fine with that. If vampires were real, I would definitely put in an application to yeah. become a vampire. <laughs> I think I'd probably be like paladin or something like that, not because of doing the right thing, just because of wearing a lot of heavy armor, getting up close and personal, being able to hit people really hard, but also being able to heal yourself when shit goes wrong. And, you know, not having to sort of, you can heal other people, but I'd be just like, no, 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 it's just, I'm just going to heal myself. I'm just going to have fun on the front lines and I'm just going to fix myself up and fuck all of you, unless you pay me a great deal of money. Don't you lose your paladin powers then? Like, that's a yeah. short lived career. That, that would be the problem with it. So sort of, maybe it's like a paladin that's, you know, not very good at it or, in service to a god who doesn't really give a shit. Who's just, he, he's a god who doesn't like people very much. He, he was a god, <laughs> he fell out with a lot of people, his, so his, his temples got burned, and he's just going, look, you know what I want right now in my life? I want a paladin who's just going to hate all of you and cause a lot of fights. And I'll be like that. It's me! <laughs> um, I think I'd have to go with like a ranger of some kind, because I'd like to cast some spells, but also I'd like to... I mean, anytime I play d and I'm almost always a barbarian because I like to get up in people's business and, and smash their faces open. Um, I don't know if that's who I am in real life. I'm just like a RPG warrior, but <laughs> casting spells would be cool too. So yeah, ranger. It's You're not an MMA player. fighter? <laughs> no. No, when it, when it comes to combat, I'm kind of a freeze or flight kind of person, unfortunately. I've learned this about myself. It's nothing unfortunate about that. Uh, I I've survived to... every fight, so. <laughs> I look like this because I don't. <laughs> uh, I would definitely want to be something like a geomancer that would just be making fortifications in the background where no one else is actually fighting because I don't want to be anywhere near the actual... I've done enough fighting in my life. I don't want to do like hand-to-hand -hand ever again. I just have had this vision now of you being a geomancer, singing about fuck it all, fuck it all. <laughs> raising it all. Raising yourself someone up with long, beautiful hair. <laughs> Cryomancer. I would, I would yeah. to see that. Yeah. Since you're talking about iteration on the same concepts like nanites, have you looked at existing magic systems within liturgy that you love to put in your own spin on? If so, which and why? Oh, I think... Going back to the card system, I would love to write a, a variation on Jake's Magical Market. That would be really fun. Okay, you have my permission. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. I would want to do the time loop. I love time loops. Uh, I, I don't think I have it in the next few years, but at some point I would love to tackle a time loop with a unique, unique twist on it, but um it's just so fun the idea that you get to perfect yourself and and learn so much and but it's also miserable and terrible at the same time and you're like trapped and <laughs> like that combination really appeals to me the misanthrope in you i see yes the the strive for perfection while you're it's like kind of like a monk thing like you know you're you deprive yourself you're trapped you're miserable you're unhappy but you're also reaching enlightenment through it like i like that that's a cool concept so most of the time when i write books i always have the ending in mind like like mm -hmm. all my stories i always start at the end and then work back to the beginning and so i've thought about time loops and then i always get myself stuck because of the way i do my outlines i'm like i can't do a time loop i'm just gonna fuck this up because i would desperately want to start at the end and i and when working backward in a time loop i'm like what am i even doing so I've given it thought, but I, and they're so cool. I agree with you, so cool, but I can't, I can't do it. Or well, maybe I will one day when I have enough time to just sit there and stare at a piece of paper. Uh, so yeah, I'm reading a book that I'm not allowed to talk about very much, but it, it's a, they, it's like a time reversion. So he goes back to points and he's like has save points. So he can go back and it, it gets really annoying when he's like really far into this plot and I'm like really excited. And then it's like, and he dies and he gets reverted back to like 
way earlier in the story. I'm like, oh. Uh, oops. Like perfect, the perfect <laughs> run? Yeah, yeah. Style, like quick save. Because that is like one of my favorite books. Love that book. Yeah. I haven't read that one, so I'll have to put that on the list. For me, I think it was uh, writing Dungeon Core. I, I like Dungeon Cores. I really enjoyed them, but I could never see me writing one because they just weren't liked for me. They just didn't didn't resonate with me at all in that way. And then I read uh, Dean Henniger's uh, Derelict. Station Core? Station Core, yeah. Or no, not Station uh, Core. Uh, yeah, so Derelicts with the, uh, this, the uh, Spaceship Core. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the, but the different sort of twist on everything where it was all technologically based and further on. And then after reading that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a go here. I'd written about, uh, about six, 700,000 words in Underverse at that point, you know, when you've just got, you've got to get something out your head. And I trapped myself to five weeks of writing uh, Age of Stone and just wrote it, you know, and you just go and it's just like it flows and you're just straight on the ball and you're like, done, there you go. And in five weeks it was done and it wasn't intended to actually ever be released. It was just something that I just needed to get out. And then uh, speaking to my editor and they had a bit of spare time and it was coming up to, <laughs> it was April Fool's Day. And I was like, mm, mm, put on, so guess what guys, here's the pre-order for my new book. Now, is it real or is it April Fool's? <laughs> and the editor was just going, what book's that? I was like, you might want to check your emails. <laughs> and that was how it came about so yeah awesome um, I think we're talking less about like magic components now and a little bit more about sub genres kind of um, yeah. I mean either or whatever I've, I've always wanted to do a tower climber Deathless Dungeoneers tried to be a tower climber at first I wrote 20,000 words of a tower climber and, and as I kept going through it again and again I was just like this is trash I can't <laughs> can't give this to my publisher. This is garbage. Uh, scrapped it all except uh, the cuttlefish character and the mandala tattoo magic system and, and started fresh with that. Those engineers know so much better, but I might try a tower climber again one day. One day. Uh, so I think uh, someone asked if we wanted to co-write in someone else's yeah magical yeah. world system. Uh, all the time. I I. I I have I've discovered I'm co-writing a book with with Ryan De Bruyne right now, and I have discovered that it's the the myth of like 50 percent of writing a book because you're like writing half the book right. It's not it's not anywhere near 50 percent. It's like 70 percent of writing a full book of of effort. And I was just like, well, that's a lot more work than I was hoping it was going to be. Uh, and I just don't have the time to do all of the things I want to write. I just don't have time for it. I write slow, unlike Jez, who could write a book in five weeks, apparently. <laughs> uh, I have an advantage there. I have two small children, and my choices were be downstairs helping to raise said children and looking after them when one of them was throwing up and stuff like that, or be in my office being very, very busy. <laughs> you five better believe I was up there. Uh, I'd love to help Don, but, you know. You did it. You works, found the Works to be done. <laughs> I could never write in someone else's world. I'm too uh, fixated on my own world. Like I, I, I don't, I couldn't follow their rules or um, let their vision shape mine. Um, it just wouldn't work for me. I, I couldn't do it. I, it would feel too unnatural. This is uh. a little bit weird. Just quickly to jump in there for just on that subject. Um, from a business background, I used to be a restaurateur and I used to be sort of in a lot of the, those kind of industries. And there was two different groups of people that were involved in restaurant management, essentially. Those people who can start up a business and can create it and make this wonderful creation. But nine times out of ten, they were crap at running it. They would create this wonderful business and it would be failing and they would hand it over to somebody else. And the second type of people are people that can come into the world, can come into that restaurant or whatever, can take it over and can tweak it and fix it and get it back on the rails and keep it running smoothly, but could never have created the world. They could never create that restaurant to be the way it is. And just the way you've said about that there, it was just like, mm, yes, totally remember yeah. working in that and working with people of both types. I'm wondering if maybe that's why some, some authors have reached out to me, and I'm sure have reached out to you guys, 
and want to write in your world, and yet we can't imagine writing in somebody else's world. And I'm wondering if that's just because different people just like in the restaurant management and so on, if that's the way that people work. You know, some people would love to work on it and some people really would never want to create it. They just like to to play in that world, a bit like D and D and stuff. So, yeah, I learned that about myself because I was a public defender, a lawyer for 10 years before becoming a writer. And when you're in trial, you have a co-counsel and some people work really great with a co-counsel and they can collaborate and they can share and they're like, yeah, go ahead and do the closing or do this part or, you know, do this witness. And I was like, I'm doing these seven things and I need you not to talk to me about them or give me any <laughs> of your suggestions because you'll get in my head and I need to just trust my instinct and go with what I believe is going to be right for these witnesses in this closing argument. And I just learned from that, that like, I can't, I can't have other people's thoughts in my head. It's too much. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. yeah I, I used to be an attorney, so I want to be like virtual high five or <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I totally know what you're saying there. But what I wanted to say is that my, sometimes my mouth words aren't as good as my word words. As in, when I write it, you know, I feel like, oh, I can get it, art you know, I can articulate myself perfectly. I can get my exact ideas down on the paper. And sometimes when I'm excited and I attempt to tell somebody in real life, this is what my book's about, or here's the story idea, I just vomit it all over everywhere. I even feel like I've done that in this panel where I'm like, guys, I really just like Pokemon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and, and I'm not really conveying myself very well because I'm like, uh, I just, I'm so excited to get this thing out. Um, and so that's why I feel like if I co-wrote anything that I would probably be being a, doing a disservice to my partner because I'd be like, oh man, we should do this thing. And then it would be cool. And there's like Pokemon, here, let me just write it all because I can't explain myself. Sorry, <laughs> just going to do it all myself. So yeah, that's how I feel what it would go. Do you, do you guys find I, this uh, after a really good day of writing? You know, where you've been really on the zone and you're really hammering through. And then you you finish. And I come downstairs and I'll speak to my wife, and she's like, "Oh, so what have you? You know, how has the day been? How's this been? Going? Good. Word good. <laughs> Word good. Exactly. Food. Uh, I'm food. the opposite. I will just like blah 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 at my at my partner, and he's like, "Cool, <laughs> cool." <laughs> Sit cool. And I. I appreciate that you say mouth words because I, I haven't met anyone else who says that. I say it all the time. I'm like, no good at mouth words. Sorry. Here's yeah, whiteboard. Yeah. Explain on whiteboard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I have worked in other people's universes before, specifically um, James Hunter and Eden Hudson. I've worked uh, within their spaces before. It was a really great collaboration to be able to work with both of them. Um, I didn't get to work with Eden Hudson as much because it was such a, a small story, but for the Firebrand series, you know, Bird and Gate Online is, is James A. Hunter's series. And he brought on three brand new authors to write that expanded universe at the same time. And it was both like madness and amazing at the same time <laughs> because there's like, three new people in this space that are just like, what if we do this? What if we do that? What about this, that, that? And it, it was craziness, but also great. And the the collaboration and, and just the creativity was so much fun and also very insane. Keeping track of who's who's made a new God and, and what they're God of and how, how this new magic power works and what this class is. And um, fortunately we had someone come through and start to make a Bible for us. Uh, a little bit too late, I think, in the game. But, but um, yeah, it was still, it was, it was great. And you know, mistakes happened. There were, of course, mistakes that happened where like one rule got broken a little bit here or bent in a different way here um, or was misrepresented somehow. But overall, I think all of the stories came out amazing and were great additions to the DGO universe. So would recommend doing it again if you have lots of time. Uh, yes, all the time. All yeah. I have probably, um, I have a folder that had, I think last I checked, it had like 32 different story ideas um, that I've got at least 10 to 15 pages worth of background and world building and magic system um, in them. Uh, and I've got, yeah, uh, lots of ideas. 
See, as a panther, I can't do it that way around. I just sort of have a scene and then I just start. And it's just, where the hell does this go? So I, I've got a load of starts for things or, or random scenes from places that I've got sort of half written that I just keep putting aside and I'll be like, ah, I'll play with that later. I'll play with that later. I'm the same way. I cannot take notes. I'll just write down the bare minimum of an idea and I'll just be like, okay, here's three sentences and then I cannot think about it because I will start the creative process of it and it'll be like, oh, you can start here and do that. And I'm like, no, I'm getting distracted. I got too many other obligations. I've got, got to finish this other work first or people will hate me even more than me not giving them Jake's sequel. So that's my problem. I actually, that's how I get them out of my head as I go and I write down the system enough that it, 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 it no longer bothers me that I'm like half developing a system in the, in the back of my head. Mm. And so that's how I get them out. It's interesting that you said that you can't do that because it would just dominate. Yeah. Yeah. I would spiral. Yeah. You, would just keep going. Yeah, you kind of write enough to where you can come back to it. If you, yeah. yeah, exactly. I definitely experienced that problem where if I have a really cool idea and I don't write it down, like, at least a couple of pages of, of the essence of it, it will not leave my brain. It's like, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me just write it down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm the exact same as uh, Xander. I just have folders and folders and folders of ideas where I've just written down a couple pages worth of everything that I thought of at the time. And I'm like, I'll get back to this one day. And you know, seven years later, there's just more and more files. You know, like, I'll get there eventually. No, you won't. <laughs> so how difficult how difficult did you guys find it to come up with your systems? Like we talked earlier kind of at the beginning of what inspired y'all, but how how difficult did y'all find it to actually come up with like the full system and everything for each of y'all's books? Um I really like D D and my husband and I have made our own like homebrew D D <laughs> system. <laughs> Cause that'll who, help. who who doesn't do that? So I feel like I had some prior experience with developing a magic system and testing it so that it was balanced you know so one thing wasn't completely op or that it wasn't broken just right out the door so i feel like playing dungeons and dragons and doing like a homebrew thing really helped me with all of my worlds so uh, i would say that uh it, it wasn't difficult um in the sense that you know i, I think the the initial difficulty wasn't there but like as i've built and developed and gone further on this series, I keep thinking, oh, I need to add this and figure out how this works a lot more. So that's the difficult for me is as, as I've gotten, you know, three to four books into to Red Mage, I have to go back and be like, oh, I need to build out, you know, node calculations. So like how the nodes generate mana or whatever. And so I have to go back and, and kind of back form something that I, I realized is totally a thing that, that I didn't remember was in the system original or didn't realize was in the system originally. So that's that's probably the difficult thing for me is is uh, the the ramping up as you kind of progress through a series to to additional um, features and as they you know get some more system mastery. Yeah, I think I I um, similar to Shami, I have a, a little bit of an advantage when it comes to system building. I worked in video games for a really long time. Mm. Uh, so I have a lot of experience uh, balancing actual real video games that have gone out to the world, some of them which weren't actually balanced when they left. So there's, you know, day one patch. Um, <laughs> but, so when I approach, especially a system that I know is going to be very crunchy, one of the first things I do is I open a spreadsheet and I start making my, my sawtooth progression scales on leveling and how XP is like acquired and what kind of monsters and how they need to tear up and yeah, I got lots and lots of spreadsheets for that. I think that would be a fantastic thing if I did it. I just <laughs> look, look it it's hard then... work. I hated it. I was like, this is just the fucking worst. Can I get back to writing it, it, the book? It's not as hard please. as when you come back to your series after like you know, writing two other series and you come back to it and go, ha, I have no idea what's going on here. Fuck. And you have to read the entire lot up to date, making notes as you go, and then write the next one because by that point once you've and i'm not saying anything from experience here once you've read and rewritten six fucking books right in book seven you're like okay <laughs> you really you really love that series at that point right you really really enjoy yeah. the, that world that you've you've committed yourself to 
at least another couple books in. Don't worry, Ryan. <laughs> We've got the juice covered. We've all got the juice. Covered. No, no. Where's the Pineapple juice missing? Juice here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's kind of my juice. I, I do think as far as like coming up with, you know, to answer the question is it sounds like Jez and I are kind of similar. I have no planning really at all in mind. I do not keep spreadsheets. I, I do take notes as I'm writing, but it is completely a shock to me what develops in the system. <laughs> I'll get through a chapter and be like, oh, wow, that changes everything. You know, and like, oh, yeah. I did not see that coming. Who knew that, that was going <laughs> to be like, okay, now I need to balance the boots. Oh, now he's in Carthage? That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> now he has this whole new power system that came out of nowhere, which, you know, that does happen. Um, but then in the, the editing process is when I try to then smooth that out and create something more comprehensive. The original first draft is a mess and um, completely like all over the place. And then I'm like, okay, this is what I did. This is what it should be. Let's play with it a bit. Let's balance it out. Try to balance it out a little bit. And, um, and then that creates it through, you know, multiple editing sessions. Uh, to answer Joshua's question is, uh, well, first of all, um, I don't think you need to be balanced for the MC necessarily. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to have um you know a, a drawbacks or, or downsides for the mc but i don't think that the mc needs to have the same powers as everyone else right um that's kind of one of the things that our genre really does well is it's that uh you know that that extra power you know uh um, jr does a really good job with that in his in his uh nova roma series where his his character yeah he operates in the same system as everyone else but not really oh. Um, and I think that those are, you, you can make it balanced for everyone else, but the MC needs to have something special about him. That's why the MC is, is the MC. Um, so I like feeling about it in the way that the system is the same for everyone. It just depends on your ingenuity. Mm -hmm. And that's why the MC is special is that they abuse or use the system abuse, <laughs> uh, in ways that, you know, gives them an upper hand or at least a slight advantage or gets them thinking about the system in a way that someone else wouldn't have. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's one of the things, it depends on what type of lit RPG you're doing. So if you're doing a, a like a VR lit RPG, like uh, Farming Livia, everyone is equal. There's there's no advantages that, that Castigan has over someone else. Um, I think in a real world situation, people are different than other people. So they're, they're gonna have different skills, different abilities. Um, so you can kind of balance those out a little differently based on what type of story you're telling. Uh, I think for sure. In, in Death of Seven Years, just for an example, like since the power system is all based around like what the dungeon will give you and there's different dungeons and different dungeon nodes will give different powers. So if you're really powerful and you own lots of dungeons, you can make yourself crazy OP but someone okay well i can't i can't add a but to that because someone who has access to that power will just cream someone who absolutely does not but that is fair in an unfair way like that's that anybody that's else could have done the same thing it's just that they didn't manage to do it in time mm -hmm. right yeah yeah well i mean take for example uh, jez you have your in your um um I, uh, age of stone your main character definitely has a, a unique power that no one else has uh, even though everyone else kind of has uh, other advantages or, or, or their own advantages, but your your main character has the dungeon that he's attached to that allows him to be, you know, the main character. Mm -hmm. But then you look at the other side and you say, well, the he's got the ability because he's a dungeon lord. He can create stuff through the dungeon. He can control the dungeon, build it. But if he met somebody else, anybody else, basically. How that's the lich, for example, has doubled down several levels into being a lich, so he's kicking the shit out of him. It's just a case of the fact that he's his magic is much more powerful than the main characters because he's invested so much more heavily in that. While the main character's gone, I need to be healthier, I need to be stronger, I need to do this, I need to invest in this, and so he survives because he's spread himself out over so much, so he's got all these different advantages, but. He just needs more potatoes is really what it is. Exactly. Needs. Everybody needs more potatoes, <laughs> Exactly. Uh, what was, so there was a question that popped up. Oh, what are your upcoming yeah, projects? Uh, yeah, upcoming. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're for five minutes from the end. Yeah, we should talk about wrapping up. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, 
I I have a the third in my Nexus Games series is coming out at the end of November, and Ooh. yeah, and my Nexus Games, you know, it, I love it just because it's a, a series of games that they everybody participates in, but it's like a wave defense game or an escort game or a you know a tag basically, but it's all deadly. So like the Hunger Games meets a bunch of video game side quests. So Squid way. Games is yeah. what you're saying. Sure, like the Squid Games only video game themed. Again, like an escort quest or wave defense, like stuff you'd find in video games. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was like, so what was the name of that again? Uh, the Nexus Games. Nexus Games. Different kind yeah. of game, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the third one comes out end of November. That's a so I'm excited. <laughs> Um, I am working on book three in Nova Roma right now, sending it to my editor in a couple weeks. And I still have like 350 plus pages to edit for my last round of editing. So it's real fun times over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> the audiobook just came out for book two. So I've been busy with that too. And um, the series is actually going to turn into five books instead of just three as I originally planned. So I have four and five mostly written, but not edited. So that will take a while to edit four and five. And then I got Jake's sequel uh, next in the burner. So my next year plus is already claimed. And then after that, I've got a like epic sci-fi lit RPG burning in the back of my mind that I'm ignoring for now, but that I really want to write. And I, I kind of think I might just take like an entire year or more off and write all five books in the series and not stress about meeting deadlines and meeting editor and stuff. And cause that really, uh, I don't yeah. like that. So I, that might be my, the next like three years of my life already planned. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I mean, I've got, um, underverse my omnibus. Cause I decided to go back and literally rewrite them when I was thought I'm gonna have to read them to, to get back to write seven, I had to reread one to six. So there were things wrong with it. It was the first books I'd written. I'd have, I, the first books I ever tried to write, I'd never tried to write before Brightblade. So it was literally a case of I went back and I went through and I rewrote them all. There's there's new scenes in it. It's not a different story. It is the same story. It's just polished. And I've got a better editing team with me who have then gone over it and over it and over it. So. We've got the, the sort of the first two omnibuses because they're too big to do as anything else are about 450,000 words each for the first two and then about 750,000 for the third, which comes out in about two weeks thereabouts. Then after that, I've got I another seven. I just yeah. bought your first one, by the way. I'm excited to read and see how it changed. Well, hope you like it, mate. Thanks. <laughs> hope you enjoy it. And um, I mean, I've got book seven coming out at the beginning of December. And then after that, it's going to be Rise of Mankind 4 in March, Feb, March time. And then Rise of Mankind 5 in probably June. After that, I've got a couple more projects on, but I'm going to be pretty goddamn busy for the rest of the this next year. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, like to it. fit it all in, I'm going to be very, very drunk at DragonCon again next year. So hopefully you'll it'll all come play. I know it's under will. All right, I'll go super fast. Um, I have Deathless Dungeon Years 3 coming out in December. Really excited about that. That's a good little wrap-up for that series. I'm working on Zero Hero uh, 3 right now, which I had to reread 1 and 2 to get back there. And that was fun. Um, and then I'm also side juggling a, a new romance pen name that's doing like a romance, kind of a gamified romance, urban, paranormal fantasy thing. It's really fun. I'm having a great time with it. And then after that, I think I'm going to write a cool, magical demon bathhouse story. I don't know. It's going to be great. Oh, that sounds yeah. amazing. <laughs> Does it take place in a bathhouse or is that a genre I'm not familiar with? Oh, uh, no, it takes place in a bathhouse. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe there's a bathhouse genre. I don't know. <laughs> there probably is. He needs yeah. to know for research yeah. purposes. Sure. And there's going to be <laughs> definitely romance in that one too, like bathhouse, naked bodies everywhere. There's got to be something going on. So I, I don't know. That's a kid movie, right? Uh, Spirited away. Spirited away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah actually, actually, it's a Japanese bathhouse. I've been I've been equating it to Spirited Away meets Monsters Inc. 
Okay. The demons like suck the stress out of your body as you relax in the bathroom. I would like to suck the stress out of my body. Anyway. Sorry. Oh, it's Go, go, go. Uh, uh, so I am writing a book with Ryan DeBrun right now called Shooter. It's um, the first book is actually, well, that's the genre or the series name. The first book is going to be called Freshman Drive. I consider that a combination of Coach Carter and Jason Bourne um, in a lit RPG. Uh, setting uh and then we've got uh, red mage 4 coming out someday ish and then a lot of other stuff and we just lost shammy um uh -oh. as well uh and that's that's take over and that's me <laughs> this is that's escape me. for it yep. all right guys well uh thanks for coming to the panel and thank you again for talking about you guys' each very different magical systems please I need to obviously read more because I after hearing everything, I need to I need to get more. Everyone needs to read more. Read Always. everyone. Buy my books. I can't hear anybody now. So hopefully you guys can hear me. I don't know. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was great. Yep. Good talking to you guys. No, yeah, thanks great time. Thanks everybody so and uh, thanks everybody that's tuned in for it. You know, it's been good yeah. fun. Thank you. Thanks. I Take a Discord to answer questions. Oh yeah. I think I'm to do I'm the dead. takeover now too or something i'm not sure yeah. should we all leave should we just all leave the studio i did it on accident already uh